turn into the next talk, which is given by Maya Pohjakallio. She's, uh, she's the senior advisor at the Finnish Chemical Industries and uh, Federation, and that she focuses on issues related to bioeconomy and circular economy. And uh, one important aspect of her work is to combine science to the regulatory issues. Uh, and uh, this is uh, influencing the decision making very strongly, and it, it shows the way, in a, in a way, for the future development. So please, Maya. Thank you. Can you hear me? So, good morning everybody, and thank you Elias for the very nice presentation. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here and I share with you some uh, ideas, some views, some examples from the chemical industry on the environmental indicators. And thank you for all the, the organizers of this conference. Uh, it's a real opportunity to, to have this presentation and thank you for all the previous presenters. Uh, we, you have had very, very interesting uh, things to to say, and I've enjoyed all the presentations so far. Uh, so, um, our federation has about 400 member companies, some of which uh, use fossil based raw materials, some use bio based, and some use mineral based. For example, you can see here the logo of Freebolt Cobalt, they produce uh, cobalt chemicals. Uh, Neste is a big chemical company in Finland that produces fuels, both bio based and fossil based. And then we have, for example, Kemira, who is a big uh, stakeholder, a big actor in water chemicals. Uh, the common uh, nominator for all our denominator for all our member companies is that they all use some kind of chemical processes in their production, of course. The chemical industry is one of the biggest industrial branches in Finland. As you can see from this figure, uh, the chemical companies bring about one-fifth of the Finland's exports. The two other big industrial sectors are the forest industry and then metals and electronics. Uh, other uh, common thing, in addition to applying chemistry for many of the chemical companies, is that they actually contribute to green solutions to, to these global needs and global challenges that Judith actually talked about too. So if you think, for example, of the food chain, you of course need fertilizers and nutrients that the chemical companies, for example, produce. Then you need pure, pure water, you need water chemicals, for water solutions, we need uh, sustainable energy, etc., etc. And of course, uh, one important branch of the chemical industry is also the production of different kinds of medicine for, for health care. Um, already in the, in the previous presentation, um, we had some, some discussion on this, how the number of people on Earth is actually growing all the time. And it is obvious that we need more resources, we need more products. Because I like the way that Judith, you said that um, as long as we live here, as long as people are on the planet, we, we need some products. We just have to make them and produce them as sustainably as possible. That's a fact. We cannot, for example, virtualize ourselves. So a lot of uh, discussion nowadays goes to digitalization. And it's true that by digitalization, we can probably decrease the amount of material used. But we cannot digitalize ourselves. We, we need physical stuff and products. That's just how it is. Uh, fortunately, during the uh, recent years, very many countries have actually put more and more effort on developing a more circular economy, which means that there will be increasing amount of recycling, reuse, and also already in the design phase of the products, people are starting to think about of the whole life cycle of the material and then the product, what happens after its use. Well, chemistry is actually a science of molecules, and so is biochemistry. So I tend to say that the chemists have kind of an extended reality without any Google assays, because we see everything as molecules. Probably that goes to biochemists as well, but you see probably more like as the cells or enzymes or, yeah. Well, anyway, uh, chemistry is very much needed when we are trying to, to make the society more circular. Because the chemist can actually see where there are the, 
a precious molecules even within waste. And, and the chemists and biochemists are able to refine these molecules into new products. Actually, there is, I suppose, too, you, you must know that there is an enzyme that is being developed for cows. That when they eat, when the cows eat this enzyme, actually their production of CH4 decreases, which I think is a very, very nice innovation. I hope. I don't know if you know what's the present situation. I suppose they are doing some pilots already. Yeah. But I think it, it shows in a nice way that the, the, the technology can really like uh, give uh, sustainable solutions to some of the challenges we are actually facing at the moment. Uh, uh, when we uh, think about developing a circular economy, we actually need to consider very many aspects. It's about developing technologies, developing new business models, new partnerships. We have already heard in very many presentations how the systemic approach is very important. So it's really important to think that we want to actually develop our society towards a more circular uh, direction. And the circular economy is not only the way how we produce things. Probably or we have to learn new ways how we consume things as, uh, uh, also. For example, probably in the future, there will be more like sharing economy. Probably in the future, we share our cars with our neighborhood or something like that, or we lease products. I, I certainly believe that these kinds of business models will um, increase in, in future. So I think we, if we just um, start uh, thinking on an individual level and on a systemic level how we can do things more sustainably, I do think that we have a future for our, for our kids. Uh, uh, a loud voice for the uh, circular economy in Europe is uh, Ellen MacArthur Foundation, and they have actually defined some of the action verbs that we should uh, use or obey when, uh, when building a society towards a more circular direction. Um, you know that in many systems there's an increasing amount of uh, artificial intelligence is in there at the moment. But even, I think that even the amount of artificial intelligence would be high, eternally high. The raw materials and technologies, they won't like reorganize or self-organize in an optimal way to all the products we need. I think the key thing is the cooperation between people. So all, all actually the, the uh, the red words here, they are people. So all these, or all we, we should cooperate. And that's why I think that this conference is a very nice platform, because we have different stakeholders here in the same conference, and it really like, uh, increases the cooperation. And I think that's the way how we can move the world towards a more sustainable direction. I'll show you three examples of the chemical industry, uh, how they actually build partnerships and circular models in the food chain uh, from the Finnish chemical industry. Um, so this is a Finnish berry, as I've written the name now. Does anybody recognize it? Yes. <laughs> is it here, the name? No? Think of berries. Has anybody uh, eating it? Cloudberry. Cloudberry, yes. Cloudberry is a very nice and tasty berry. It grows in the forests. Uh, so the food industry uses it and we can get very delicious food out of it. But sometimes there are some products in which the seeds are left over. So actually then the side stream of the, street of the seeds is taken to a small company in the northern Finland called Arontek, and then they extract oil from the seeds, and then there's a Finnish cosmetic company called Lumene. They buy the oil from the seeds, and then they use it in skincare. It's very good for your skin, it's got a lot of vitamin C. That's what I've told, being told. Another example is how you can produce bioethanol out of food waste. Of course, there's nothing new in producing bioethanol by fermentation. I think people have been doing that for, I don't know, how many thousand years. But the innovation of this company is that actually they have built quite a cost-effective way how they can um, produce the bioethanol near the source of waste in a distributed manner. 
So that's their innovation. And then the bioethanol is used as a component in, in, in petrol, in cars, it's a biocomponent. And what is also important is that you get size, side streams, you can get some nutrients out of it, etc. Sometimes also some, some bio-based chemicals. Their newest innovation is that they have started uh, actually a production of bioethanol out of sawdust. I think it's the worst in the world. Then we have a big Finnish company called Nest. That they use a lot of waste fats and oils, uh, which are actually um, chemically based. They are esters, and then they turn them with hydrogen in the, into a mixture of uh, hydrocarbons, which can be used as a renewable diesel in cars. And actually, the, the renewable diesel has so good quality that you can use it even in aeroplanes. So you can think that the raw material leftovers from the food chain can actually be used to fly your plane. Which I think it's a... When we get these kinds of models to increase, uh, it will be super fantastic. And then the Neste is actually putting a lot of effort on, on R&D and as this renewable diesel is the mixture of hydrocarbons, you can use the same technology for producing raw material for bio-based plastics. And now they have partnered with the Swedish big uh, company IKEA. I suppose you all know IKEA. Yes? So they have partnered with IKEA because IKEA wants to get more bio-based raw materials for its uh, furniture and products. And they're going to actually, quite soon, I think this year or the second, next year, they're going to start the industrial production of, of bio-based polymers. The raw material of which actually comes mainly from the food chain. Um, then uh, the chemical companies have actually for more than two decades uh, collaborated in sustainability work. Have you ever heard of a program called Responsible Care? Anyone? No. Somebody is lifting up the hands, but I, I suppose he's not waving. Uh, Responsible Care is a voluntary program of the chemical sector, and it's an international program. It's, uh, uh, it takes place in over 60 countries, and uh, it's actually implemented uh, in a special way in, in different countries, but of course it has some, some common basis. In Finland, the central themes of the program include sustainable use of resources, uh, and then security, well-being of the work community, and over interaction. And within this uh, responsible care program, indicators are collected from the committee companies, and also best practices are shared in workshops, etc., etc. Uh, two of my colleagues, they actually do a lot of work every year when they collect all the amount of data from the committee's companies. So it's our federation who coordinates this uh, program in Finland. So uh, they collect the, the data from the companies and then we analyze them a bit and then we publish and follow the results annually. About 50 indicators totally are collected. And here you can see some examples of the progress. So actually, we already have in Finland, so these results represent the chemical sector in Finland. Uh, we already have quite a lot of indicators covering the resource efficiency, environmental impacts, and also the types of feedstocks. And here you can see how the amount of grease has, greenhouse, greenhouse gas emissions has decreased, and how the energy efficiency has increased, etc. You can see here the reference year. The reference year marks the year when the indicator was taken into use in the Responsible Care program. Because the set of indicators is being developed all the time, new indicators are, are added. One of the most recent indicators actually are these, which are related to circular economy. So we have started to collect uh, some data from the companies, how much of their raw material use is bio-based and how much is secondary. We have all just collected this for two years, so we don't have any trend yet. But if we collect this for 10, 20 years, then we can see if there's a trend within the Finnish chemical industry, for example, an increase in the use of secondary raw materials. 
These results are from the year 2016, so from the last year. And then the one thing I want to point out is that these are average numbers. Um, some of our companies, their raw materials is 100% secondary, and for some it's near to zero. So this doesn't uh, actually represent any company, just the, the average of the chemical sector in, in Finland. Uh, then the, the indicators and the results and all the work of the responsible care is related to a sector-related uh, responsibility program. Of course, individual companies, they have indicators and measures uh, others as well, but more specific ones. And one quite recent indicator that the process industry has used is called uh, Eco Efficiency Indicator Framework Gaia Refiner. There's quite recent um, scientific publication on the development of this indicator set as well, so here's a reference if you want to look at the details. But just some main points. There are actually three characteristics for the Gaia Refiner indicator. Is that it's quite broad. I'll soon show you the system boundaries. Then what I find very interesting is that they not just collect the data, but then they compare the collected data to the reference data they have collected from the existing processes and from some simulations as well. And then the third point is that they have find quite a nice set how to visualize the results in a very condensed way. Uh, actually, the, the Gaia Refiner is based on these seven eco-efficiency guidelines that have been given in 1997. And if you compare these, they are quite in line with the uh, principles of the circular economy. Because now there's a big boom of circular economy and people sometimes think it's something very new. But in a way, circular economy, I think it combines many of the things that have been happening for decades, and now it's a new way and new importance has been found for it. Uh, as I already said, the, this indicator set is quite broad, so it covers the, uh, the life cycle of the production from the extraction of raw materials to products end life. So indicators are collected in all these areas. And uh, this is how it's visualized. So you can see that there are 10 sets of indicators, altogether more than 30 indicators. And uh, then the benchmarking, the comparison is displayed by colors. So it's quite easy to get an overall picture how your process or product compares to some others. I like, I like the, the way, and the, you can see, for example, that for water, you have water intensity and water scarcity. So then you can also compare your production on two different uh, geographical sites, because of course water scarcity depends on in which area you are, you are doing your production. There's the, uh, this refiner, this Gaia refiner, uh, this version has actually been developed in uh, cooperation with Metal industry, industries, so production of metals out of ores. Uh, there's also a refiner, um, an indicator set called bio, bio refiner, which is more specific to bio-based industries. So a bit different indicator sets, for example, nutrient recycling and, and waste treatment are, are added in a different way. Here is the source if you want to have a look more in details. I also have a list which I'm not going to read through, you'll get the presentation, but here you can get uh, some picture of what kind of indicators are, are included in each of the groups. Today we have heard quite a lot of discussion on land use, so I don't know, do these uh, indicators seem relevant from your perspective, because you are experts, good, yeah. And there are chemical risk, resource equation, material efficiency, impacts, and then the end use of life as well. Then just very quickly, just two words, uh, how actually industry is learning from the nature and more and more actually working in an industrial symbiosis. So 
the idea is the same that in nature, that there would be like zero waste communities and um, kind of um, so that very many uh, industrial um, producers and factories would work in a very close cooperation. And there is one industrial symbiosis quite near here, actually about 40 kilometers from Helsinki. It's called the Kilpilahti area. It's the largest refinery, oil refinery and petrochemical cluster in the Nordic countries. As you, as you can see, on the same side, there are very many uh, different companies who cooperate a lot and they also exchange materials and exchange energy and the idea is to make the production more sustainable and also more cost efficient of course. Uh, they are actually trying to develop their symbiosis all the time and within this project they have now found a new vision for the whole area, so a common vision for all the companies and then they are also trying to look for tools and, and areas of development for the whole area. So not just for an individual company, but for the whole area. As you can see, there are 19 industrial companies who have participated. And what I find very interesting, they have actually made common material waste and energy balances. So this is an example of the energy balance of a sandy diagram. The, the gray area is actually proportional to the amounts. So if you think that you can optimize the production on an industrial symbiosis case, it's of course much more sustainable than optimizing on just one unit space. So they have identified already three areas of development, uh, which are the exploitation of waste heat, defining of biofractions, and then increasing the, the cooperation. And they have also defined some indicators how they would follow the development of the industrial symbiosis. I myself think that the industrial symbiosis will be one of the, the key actors or will play a crucial role when we are building the circular economy. Then to sum up, uh, the development of the circular economy is needed, that's for sure. And then the chemical companies have actually quite an uh, you know, important part to play. This one actually shows a bit how the sustainability thinking has developed within chemical industries, I suppose it goes for the food industry as well and the process industries together. So we started from material energy issues to emissions, but now we look at things in a much more holistic, holistic way. And actually the forerunner companies are already here. So already in the core of their business strategy, they have the sustainable development. So thank you very much for your attention and I'd love to hear your comments and questions if, if there is any, any time. So thank you, Maya. You very, very nicely uh, painted the picture in front of our eyes about the possibilities or potential of the future developments in, within the industries. And so uh, I started feeling that after all there is light in the end of the tunnel. <laughs> Yeah, so, but I, yeah, but so, I think, yeah, I think the, the, the key word is cooperation and cross-sectoral multi-stakeholder cooperation. That's the way to the future. So, uh, please, if there are any questions uh, to Dr. Pohjakalle, you could please present. Now it's a good opportunity to continue the discussion. If you didn't guess, I'm a chemist by profession. <laughs> I like molecules, yeah. Ari. Okay, thank you very much for this very uh, interesting presentation. And uh, I'd like to ask uh, maybe two questions. First, um, how do you see Finnish chemical uh, industry companies, how eager they are in pursuing this uh, future in practice? Because we all know that uh, heavy industry is very much tied with the economics and very short period economics all the time. And, uh, we, all can see uh, also economic benefits, but how uh, easy or difficult it is in practice, you can observe it from very, very good position. 
And then, how do you see in other countries, are these industrial symbioses uh, very abundant already, or, or are they just coming? How do you see? Uh, yes, thank you for the interesting question. Um, first of all, we think of Finland. Finland is a small country, so I think our oh, two is that um, now I think there is a really strong will to, to develop the circular economy. We have this roadmap that has been actually written um, in the lead of Sitra and our Prime Minister and now very many of our ministers are very involved in, in building a circular economy. So I think there is a great will and the, the one good thing in Finland is that we are so few so it's easy to build cross-sectoral um, cooperation if we want to. And I, and I see that the, the chemical industry is very willing to build, build cross-sectoral uh, cooperation. Because already now I think the chemical industry cooperates or, um, or produces solutions or products to all other areas of the industry. So I, I think it, um, I'm very positive. Of course there are some differences between companies. Some companies are more um, forerunners than others, and then some companies, if they are very small, they, even though they would like to, they can't think of very far in the future because they have to have cash flow all the time. For big companies, they can, it's sometimes more easier for them to develop things on a long perspective because they are not dependent on the everyday cash flow. But then again, you need the, the cooperation between uh, small companies and big companies. But I'm, I'm, I'm positive. And then if you think of the European level as well, uh, one of the uh, focus areas of the European Commission is the circular economy. So there is a strong political will to take it forward. And I think some of the leading countries, in addition to Finland, are for example UK, because I know you have quite many industrial symbiotes, for example, British sugars and probably dairy interesting as well, and, and then Denmark and, and the Netherlands. I would name them. Would you, do you agree from the industrial point of view? Yeah. yeah. So, we'll say that um, we are probably, how do I say, I'm positive, but it's, um, we have very good will and good plans, but now we have to start acting faster. Yeah. And the cooperation is the key. I was explaining all things from the chemical industry's point of view, of course, but the chemical industry alone won't save the planet. We, we need to, to cooperate. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for highlighting the responsibility of the big industries, as well as the importance of cooperation, because otherwise, if we don't have the cooperation or, or the contribution by the big players, uh, it's uh, very hard to, uh, or very uh, unjust to require or demand that uh, small industries would make the change. <laughs> Even though they are innovators, they cannot uh, make it alone. And so it's a, the situation is something like a, a they have uh, as a milk producers in Vietnam or as the land users in Zimbabwe, we don't have, they don't have the resources. And they, they just have to follow the simple rules of sur surviving. And so in, in that sense, uh, uh, we need uh, responsible big players, and uh, uh, their attitude is very important for the development. And then one, I think, very important thing concerning the survey economy is the, the role of the big brands, for example, IKEA, Nike, etc. Because if they start to adapt some kind of trend, for example, they want to increase the amount of uh, secondary raw materials and bio-based raw materials in their products, actually changes can happen quite fast much faster to, through these brands than through regu regulatory development, which is quite slow. Yeah, thank you very much. So, so I, I warm, warmly want to thank all the lecturers of today, this morning session, and uh, it has been very enjoyable to listen to all your views and, and sophisticated. Uh, presentations and so now we, we will then uh, have the time for lunch we have almost used the lunch <laughs> break
So what's, what's the result of the voting? Should we skip the lunch and continue or should we then delay a little? No, no hands rising up. So that's, that, that's clear. So we have to go for lunch and maybe we try to be as quick as we can. So maybe uh, we'll return back maybe, uh, by uh, quarter past. Uh, would that be okay? The lunch is uh, very close in the same room where we had the coffee break. So thank you very much.